Yeah, babe. Are you still Hey everybody, welcome back to Cellular and Wireless Unmasked. Had a little break there, but we're back in business. And what I wanted to talk about today was the evolution of cellular from our first generation networks to 4G, which is the most popular right now. We'll get to 5G, but before we get to 5G, I wanted to kind of explain how we got to where we are today. So hang on. Okay, so let's jump right to it. I want to talk today about the first generation cellular networks, second, third, and fourth. We'll spend a little bit of time on 1, 2, and 3G, but I'll spend the bulk of the time on 4G and break down all the different frequency bands and what they mean and who's using them. Uh, we'll get to all this here in due time. I did want to mention there actually was what they consider a 0G network. It was before the first commercial 1G networks, which came out around 1979, 1980. Uh, 0G in the early to mid 70s, very crude radio phones, not very effective, uh, very spotty coverage, uh, not very popular. So let's jump into 1G. Okay, so first generation cell networks. These were launched primarily in the 850 megahertz band. And these networks were very, very crude. They were analog still. Um, they provided the first users to, to have that mobile experience. These were commonly the car phones uh, of the early 80s up into um, the late 80s. Uh, they were very big, very bulky. You might remember seeing the, the, the giant hands that you had to carry with a cord to the phone. Um, they hogged a lot of, of battery life, um, which is why they were commonly in cars. Uh, it was based on a technology called Advanced Mobile Phone System, AMPS. All that meant is you had a radio which interfaces with the PSTN, the publicly switched telephone network. That was the whole basis for AMPS. Hey, we have a radio which can make phone calls. Let's call it AMPS. First generation, very crude, all analog. And the one thing about an all analog network, you had no privacy. Anybody with a handheld scanner could listen into your conversation. And they were close enough to get both radios and get the whole conversation. It would get both sides. So really, these were very, very advanced for their time, hence the advance in amps, but they were still crude and had a long way to go. Okay, let's talk about 2G, the second generation of cellular networks. This was the time when networks went from analog to digital. So you still had your 850 megahertz band, and that was your analog. But this gave birth to PCS, personal communications, personal communication systems. This was digital. So what we started to see is privacy and security on cellular networks. So instead of just your basic boring analog system from 1G uh, in 1991, they thought let's try to make our, our channels more efficient and let's give people some privacy versus digital. PCS, That's, this is digital, this was analog. So really you started to see new technologies, more people being able to share the channels. This brought the prices down. This, when you got the higher frequency bands, this phone started to get smaller, it's technology. Uh, GSM was launched the Global System for Mobile Communication, and CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access. These are digital schemes used to break down a channel and allow more users to share that channel kind of in real time. So there's these digital coding techniques uh, allow the spectrum to be used very efficiently, and these are digital techniques. So really, 2G brought us from the old analog age into the digital age. You started to see little tiny mobile data tidbits like multimedia messaging systems. You could send little text messages and little bits of data. This was the start of mobile data on the back end of 2G. This started in 1991 and right around the 2000s when we saw 3G. So let's talk about 3G. But before we get to 3G, I wanted to mention the Nextel IDEN network. They used proprietary technology from Motorola called IDEN, Integrated Dispatch Enhanced Network. Nextel was the one of the first, I don't want to say the first, but one of the first networks to launch all digital. There was no analog component to complement the digital frequencies. 
as you saw networks evolve from 1, 2 to 3G, you had that analog component and you had a digital at the same time. The Nextel network launched all digital from day one. Now, they used TDMA, time division, multiple access, to make their channels multiplex to bring more people into each channel. And it was on the 800 megahertz SMR band. So, specialized mobile radio. Basically, this was a two-way radio band. Nextel integrated that two-way radio with the mobile telephony and allowed you to have a cell phone which also behaved like a walkie-talkie. It was novel for the time. It was very, very uh, efficient when it had small amount of users. Uh, Nextel struggled with their growth because the TDMA technology was kind of an old technology and it was very, very sensitive to interference. Nextel was also one of the first networks to allow for packet data. It was all digital. It allowed for some more data capabilities. So you had the ability very early on in the early 2000s to surf the web mobily with the Nextel phone. A little bit of ahead of its time, but it was kind of an older technology, but I wanted to mention it. Nextel. So let's talk about 3G, the third generation of wireless technologies. 3G is when we saw the evolution of networks go from voice-centric to data-centric. Things like CDMA, code division, multiple access, primarily was designed for uh, voice coding, gave birth to CDMA 2000. And this is what allowed us to do data services over the same networks. So with 3G, you still have that 850 cellular and the 1900 PCS channels you saw them come together and where a carrier was either 850 or 1900, you saw them together now. You saw dual band networks. You saw phones that were capable of two different bands. You saw the evolution of uh, GPRS, General Packet Radio Service, and EDGE, which is enhanced data rates for GSM. So these are data only services. Um, not terribly exciting, but in their day they were neat because you could stay connected to the internet. But really what drove that data revolution and made phones like, like the iPhone work is EVDO. EVDO was a great technology um, that allowed for multiple megabyte download speeds. Uh, it went through a couple different uh, revisions through its life cycle. EVDO was a great 3G technology for data. It uh, started to give you those little MiFi devices, the dongles you plug into your laptop so you could stay on the internet wherever you were. 3G, this is really what showed us cell phones could do more. They could be data devices for us. And that really gave an explosion with 4G. So we'll get to 4G now. Okay, let's talk about 4G, the fourth generation of wireless networks. Yes, 5G is the new hot thing going right now. But really, 4G is that foundation, and 4G is really what unlocked great potential with cell phones. 4G today is still under development, and there are still technologies being launched to enhance 4G. There's still milk to come out of this cow, so don't discount 4G just because 5G is coming out. 5G is in its infancy. If 5G were a baseball game, we're one out into the first inning. We have a long way to go with 5G. Buckle up for that one. And that's, that'll be one of our future videos. But let's talk about 4G. 4G, fourth generation, data. We saw that 3G networks could do so many good things. 4G unlocked more. It gave us true broadband on the move. When we say 4G, we think of LTE, long-term evolution. But really, 4G started technology called WiMAX that Sprint announced in around 2007-2008. This was the wireless interoperability for microwave access. It was a 4G technology. It was in the 2.4 gigahertz band. That's 2400 megahertz. And uh, it was one of the first 4G networks to show us you could have multiple uh, multiple megabyte download speeds, really, really broadband stuff on the move. Uh, we also saw the emergence of HSPA, uh, also called HSDPA and HSUPA. High speed packet access, high speed download packet access, high speed upload packet access, but really they just call it HSPA. 
This was what T-Mobile launched to get their first 4G network up to compete with Sprint's WiMAX. This was also the Clearwire, I don't want to call it a debacle, but Clearwire is no longer with us today. Anyway, moving on, 4G. When Verizon got a hold of 4G LTE, instead of deploying it in 850 or 1900, Verizon chose 700 megahertz. That became their vehicle of choice for 4G LTE. At around the same time, L LTE was also launched by AT&T in that same band. First networks came out, people went, wow, LTE, this is great. My phones do more, uh, I can connect my laptop, I can really do great things using this new band. Soon, as more and more people started using 4G, these bands became crowded with data users. Since 850 and 1900 were, re were, were reserved, 850 was primarily for voice, 1900 for 3G technologies. They needed another vehicle for 4G services. Thus gave birth to 2100. This was commonly known as AWS advanced wireless services. When Verizon launched this, they called it XLTE. Just the commercial name Verizon shows for their AWS service, 2100. So now you've got data in 2100, 4G, and you've got data in 700. Now what the carriers are doing right now is they're sunsetting their 3G technologies and they're moving that voice channel, that CDMA, that GSM, over to the 850-1900 bands. They're converting those bands. T-Mobile for the longest time was just 1900 and 2100. And they got into the 700 game and they got a little bit of spectrum there. They called this their long range LTE when they launched that because the lower frequencies reach farther, it goes through walls better. T-Mobile was a bit limited when they had just these two bands. Now they've got more. They even have some 600 megahertz so they can really reach deep into those rural communities with their services now 4g so popular the explosion of smartphones all new capabilities these channels became crowded quickly so the carriers looked for new ways new frequency bands to expand their offerings for more bandwidth so we saw frequency bands like 2.5 2.5 gigahertz this was a Sprint band. Sprint was running LTE in 2.5 along with 1900. This was what they called Spark. That was just a commercial name for it, but 2.5 gigahertz. AT&T also had some frequencies in the 2.3 gigahertz spectrum. This was called WCS. Simply put, Wireless Communication Services. So all these frequencies together you can imagine when you have to put together a cell site, you've got to have radios. They can't all be the same. They have to be different because of the frequency bands. You've got a 700 megahertz radio, an 850, a 1900, a 21, a 22.5. Now, not all the carriers have all these uh, licenses for each of these bands. They kind of mix and match, but they're all multi-band these days. And like I said, they're sunsetting their 3G tech to convert that over to 4G. And these are your primary bands today, 850 megahertz, 1900, 700, 2100, AWS, 2.5 gig. AT&T doesn't really use a whole lot of 2.3. There's some interference problems with uh, GPS satellites. So this doesn't really, uh, it's not really in widespread use. 2.5 is. When T-Mobile acquired Sprint last year, they took this, this, this frequency band they had and they really expanded its use and they're really pushing this hard and it's doing really well for AT&T. So this is 4G today. This is where we are. More often than not, if you're using your phone to download a YouTube video, uh, upload a photo, or have a voice uh, uh, video chat with a friend, you're using 4G LTE. Yes, 5G is out there. Yes, it's, it's getting more and more prevalent, but 4G is our workhorse and 4G is not gonna go anywhere for a long time. Okay, let's talk about how the carriers are maximizing their 4G LTE offerings today. Like I said, there's still fruit to bear here with 4G LTE. It's still our workhorse. As 5G continues to roll out, we're gonna depend upon 4G. Everything with 4G is in the pursuit of bandwidth. 
That's the size of your channel. The more spectrum you have, the larger your bandwidth. So the more bandwidth available, the better you're gonna have a wireless experience. More users on the same cell site hog bandwidth. That's why they're building so many more towers and so many more small cells to produce more bandwidth. Now, there's a couple of ways they can take the networks to give you more bandwidth the bigger channel. There's technology called carrier aggregation. A lot of carriers have multiple frequency bands to choose from, 700, 600, 850, 1900, 2100, 2300, 2500. If it's quiet, there's not a lot of users on the system, what they can do is they can add up the bandwidth across bands so you're not just using 700, you're not just using 850 or 1900, you can use pieces of all these frequency bands together to make one giant channel. That's called carrier aggregation. So this requires not a whole lot of use because if everyone's using it and there's not a lot of carriers available to aggregate, but for times when there's not a lot of users, not a lot of demand, carrier ag can give you a big channel, a lot of throughput. One of the other technologies is LAA and AWS3. These are very similar in nature. LAA, Licensed Assisted Access. AWS is Advanced Wireless Services. It's just an upper band, AWS3. How Licensed Assisted Access works is it's a five gigahertz channel, 5,000 megahertz, not to be confused with, confused with 5G. What LAA does, you place a data session call, you download a YouTube video, you send a picture to your friend. If the licensed channel has an LAA channel option, it will hand you down to that five gig LAA option and offload the licensed channel. And then this channel, this LAA channel, will handle your data session. AWS works the same way. They live in the shadow of a licensed frequency. And these are some of the techniques that carriers use to maximize how they use their 4G systems.